I'm Shankar Vedantam, here to tell you about a great mystery. That mystery is you. As the host of a podcast called Hidden Brain, I explore big questions about what it means to be human. Questions like, where do our emotions come from? Why do so many of us feel overwhelmed by modern life? How can we better understand the people around us? Discover your hidden brain. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. In 2023, the most talked about cultural events came from two trailblazing women artists. Welcome to the Eras Tour. I hope you feel liberated, but the renaissance is not over. Taylor Swift and Beyonce's massive tours were turned into major movie releases. But as all that was going on, another documentary about a female icon quietly entered the chat. This is radio at Harvard, broadcasting from Cambridge. We are lucky to have Joan Baez here, Baez, on our show tonight. I know that you'll enjoy listening to her. Some say that love is a gentle thing, but it only has brought me pain. Joan Baez, I Am a Noise, is an intimate portrait of the life of Joan Baez, the legendary singer, songwriter, and political activist who came up in the 1960s folk scene. The documentary was made on the occasion of her final concert tour in 2019, just before Baez turned 80 years old. Ms. Baez, how did you originally get your start in folk? Just picked up a guitar and started copying everybody in Harvard Square. I was so bored with college, that's exactly what I did. I'll be no man's wife. Joan Baez is one of the most influential folk singers in American history, and she came onto the scene at a very young age, right at the dawn of what we think of as the 1960s folk revival. Jenny Rothenberg Gritz recently interviewed Joan Baez for Smithsonian Magazine. She made her big debut at the age of 18 at the Newport Folk Festival, the very first Newport Folk Festival in 1959. And she kind of stole the show from a lot of established acts like Pete Seeger and Odetta. And shortly after that, she also became very instrumental in the civil rights movement. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. She started playing music at rallies. She performed at the March on Washington, leading a quarter of a million people singing We Shall Overcome. And really throughout her whole career, she never wavered from being this kind of pure activist who always stood up for her ideals at a time when other people went down different avenues. In a lot of ways, Joan Baez was the opposite of what we think of as these big mega concerts with Taylor Swift and Beyonce. They have huge pyrotechnics and all these effects and glamour. Joan Baez would just get up there and sing and she'd have the audience sing along and she would be barefoot. And in the film, I guess she would have been 79 at her last concert tour and she would still just get up there without shoes on. She just sits up there with her short gray hair and people come to her because not to see a spectacle, but because they feel like they're part of it. She feels like she's inviting them onto the stage in some kind of way, like she's just at the same level as they are and raising them all up. But despite her down-to-earth nature, Joan Baez was a huge star. Getting to interview Joan Baez was a full-circle moment for Jenny. So my father tells me that the first time he and my mother met, it was at a party. He was there with his best friend who was a teacher at the same school as my mom. And when he walked into the room and he saw her, he said, she was the Joan Baez type. She was just the type I liked. And I think what he meant was my mom, that's, she was actually a singer and she played uh, folk music on a nylon string guitar. And she just had that kind of pure, soulful, kind of creative chick vibe that my dad really liked because of Joan Baez. So thank you to Joan Baez that I exist. Wow. You didn't share that story with her, I don't think. I don't think I did. But, you know, I'm sure that would be like the 10 millionth time someone told her their parents got together because of her music. (laughs) From Smithsonian Magazine and PRX Productions, this is There's More to That, the show where you can learn about both the Renaissance and Beyonce's Renaissance. On this week's episode for Women's History Month, we'll hear Jenny's conversation with Joan Baez 
And later, we'll find out what this folk icon has to do with the big tours making headlines today. I'm Chris Clement. Find timeless gifts from your favorite museums at the Smithsonian Store. Shop museum-inspired jewelry, home goods, clothing, books, toys, and more. Save 10% and get free shipping when you go to smithsonianstore.com and enter the promo code PODCAST10 at checkout. All profits support the Smithsonian's mission. Remember to use code PODCAST10 when you shop smithsonianstore.com today. Hi, Joan. It's such an honor to be able to talk to you today. Thank you very much. I hope I live up to whatever your expectations might be. <laughs> Jenny began the conversation by talking about how forthcoming the folk icon is in the documentary. Well, what we talk about is my wanting to have left an honest legacy. I just figure that at my age and this point in my life, I have nothing to lose by it. just telling the truth, letting the wrinkles show. You know, I think of folk music as being kind of the music of the people and the music of authenticity. I'm curious, a part of what drew you to the genre was how it was the music of the people. Well, of course. I mean, I was encouraged to sing opera by a number of people at a number of stages in my life. And, and I would sing at home to my mother's favorite opera singers and do duets with them and everything, but I never really wanted to pursue it. And it was the boots on the ground aspect of folk music that drew me. And we used to call it bubblegum music and that folk music came along to combat that. A big turning point seems to have been the March on Washington. That was a huge, huge event that you were such an integral part of. How did that change your experience of what music was really for? That movement, what I was involved in, started earlier because I'd been going to hear kings speaking in these little towns and little churches, and I had already begun what I think a lot of people on that day of the, the speech that it kind of solidified a lot of their thoughts and feelings. And certainly it, after that, there wasn't any question about the direction that I was going, who I was going with. For listeners who are just getting their first exposure to Joan Baez now, where would you recommend they start? If there's one album, which one do you send them to? The album of original music that I think is sort of the most iconic is Diamonds and Rust. Everyone loves that because the title song is about Bob Dylan. It's the best breakup song. And if you're offering me diamonds and rust, I've already paid. The name that's most often linked with Joan Baez is Bob Dylan, and that's because she arguably really launched his career. I mean, she's very humble, and she says he would have been discovered either way, but in a very literal way, she found him at some small folk venues in Greenwich Village, and she brought him on stage where she had a huge following already, and she said, everyone, you've got to listen to this guy from Minnesota, and people at first were like, well, who is this terrible singer? He plays three <laughs> chords. He's nothing like you, and she said, no, 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 give him a chance, and they had a very interesting synergy because she didn't write most of her songs at that point. She was singing traditional folk songs. And he was, of course, writing these amazing prophetic songs like Blowing in the Wind and Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. And she would then start to sing his songs and they became part of the folk canon. Yeah. And I mean, this might be another example of a man kind of getting more credit for something that a woman really initiated, right? I think it's fair to say that Bob Dylan's fame eclipsed hers over time. It did. And that was a real breaking point in the relationship. She and Bob Dylan had a kind of a tempestuous romance. It sounds like it was pretty short lived. And he famously kind of denied it. And a reporter asked him if they were together. And he said, no, they were just friends. And she was devastated by that. Diamonds and Rust kind of summed up their relationship where she says, As I was lousy, you say, 
my poetry was lousy, you said. <laughs> I always think those two lines sum up what her takeaway from the relationship. I was struck that in the film that there's a painting you made of Dylan that's in a very prominent place right above your piano. And he has a great look on his face. It's so Dylan. He's so suspiciously, you know, it's like <laughs> peering out. What are they doing to me now? You know? What did you call him? Mr. Sunshine or Mr. 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 Happy Face? <laughs> Mr. Happy oh, Face. Yeah. I'm kind of curious. I mean, it's a great picture, but why that's the picture you want to be looking at when you're making music at the piano, that face, that expression. Oh, that changes. That changes from here to there, but probably, probably whatever I've just finished something is when I hang it somewhere, and so that mm. that's what's going on then. Yeah, that's, it's interesting because I think one reason people are fascinated by that synergy is you were the real activist, and you were the one who all throughout your life continued in that spirit. And really, he wrote a few songs that became important in the movement, but it doesn't seem like he had the same kind of motivations that you did. You know, when you say that, I think maybe early on that he might have. But our sort of big rift in that came partly because I was pushing. I wanted him to show up at marches and be political, and it just wasn't his interest. I'm glad it wasn't. He spent the time writing those songs we used, you know, really. But I, you know, I feel as though I, I'm sorry I was demanding so much of him when it wasn't where he wanted to be. That's interesting. You used the phrase in the film that you became addicted to activism, which I'm curious, what's the difference between just earnestly trying to make the world better and actually having an addiction to activism? I didn't realize that that was part of what was going on. Uh, no, it was definitely earnest and it was definitely useful. But when I see the film and I see how much I was not there for my son and for whatever reasons I stayed out there. And when you first started, folk music was very earnest and very pure and and there are people who started out that way and then got kind of trippy and groovy and i'm curious what that was like at the time for you to see the grooviness and psychedelia kind of take over well if i'd been a part of the psychedelia i would have seen it differently but i i sort of divorced myself from it partly because i was snooty but partly because i just didn't have a place there i mean if i had taken the drugs i would have found some way to, better way to relate to all of it for those of us born and afterwards, it's hard to imagine what it was like to grow up just after World War II and be the first kids growing up hiding under your desks. And I know that you famously <laughs> rebelled as a teenager and said, this is ridiculous. If a nuclear war happens, this desk isn't going to help us. I mean, what do you think younger people don't understand about that sense of urgency that you felt? Well, there's plenty to feel urgent about now. <laughs> Oh. No, seriously, that that looks like peanuts right now compared really? to what's going on now. Yeah. There's a song that it's sort of a deep cut that I hadn't heard before until I started digging around recently, but that song for the children of the 80s, it came out in 1983 when I was yeah. eight years old. And it, it's such an interesting song. We're the children of the 80s, haven't we grown? We're tender as a lotus. You sing, we'd like the music of the 60s. We think that era must have been nifty. Flower children, Woodstock, and the war. But that was a time when Reagan was kind of trying his best to erase the 60s. It was, you know, their television shows like 30-something about activists kind of growing up and becoming yuppies. And I'm curious what was going on for you, just that aspect of dissociation and disillusionment of what was happening in society after the 60s. I think I was looking for a way to keep something alive. I wanted to find something for the kids of this generation that were floating around without a Vietnam and without a civil rights movement to center their thoughts and ideas of where they could be and what they could be doing. So it was kind of to honor them and to listen to what I thought probably were their biggest complaints. I remember I called Bono. I said, I got this song I want to do, sort of like a weird the world. I thought, well, I've written this thing. It's really cool and it's current. And he's so sweet. He said, well, you know, I'm busy. <laughs> you know, first of all, it has to be a really good song. Which he wasn't on that level. But he is so kind. I've been to a lot of rallies in recent years. And when I was growing up, there were punk bands or there were certain hip hop bands that were political. But the impression I get from the film and other footage I've seen is that music was such a part of the political scene when you were a part yeah. of it. And it doesn't seem integrated in the same way. It's not. I got to say, somebody showed me, I didn't go, but a, a video of Taylor Swift's concert in Levi Stadium. Mm. I mean, that's 100,000 screaming fans singing every single note. And she has shifted something in the whole industry. 
She's a good, sweet person. And I saw some video of her having out with her family because she wanted to say something politically and they're saying, <laughs> don't do it. And she was mm-hmm. getting very weepy because she didn't want to have to fight for that right. So it's in there. But musically, it's hard for me to connect. You know, my granddaughters and the Phoebes and Lana Del Rey, whom I know and love, and a lot of whose music I like. But I'm in another world, and I don't pretend that I'm going to keep up with all this. And I was heartened by Pete Seeger when somebody asked him what music he listened to, and he said, he doesn't unless he's going to the ice rink with his grandchildren. <laughs> That's a force to listen to music. I love that. <laughs> Well, you know, the film, of course, you know, follows you on your last concert tour. And there's this open question about how you're going to feel when you stop touring. So now that it's been a while, I'm curious whether the sense of freedom or the sense of loss is stronger. Uh, I have not missed being on the stage for a second. I have missed occasionally having the voice be supple enough to say, oh, yeah, I'll get up and sing with so-and-so and being really uncertain if I can even do that. But as far as being on the road, I don't know. I'm fine. And I have probably in some ways never been busier in my life. I'm just finishing editing a poetry book. That's amazing. We get a sense from the film of this life where you take good care of yourself. You go swimming, you use the treadmill, you go for barefoot walks in big cities, which I love the barefoot (laughs) scenes. Do you feel like those things are kind of coming more into the foreground now that you've completely let go of the public side of it, at least on stage? Well, there's no pavement where I live, so I walk barefoot <laughs> around my house and in the field across the street. I'm pretty countrified, and I don't go very far. For the COVID years, I didn't want to go anywhere. I couldn't get enough of not tuning up the guitar and going back on tour. Mm. I'm curious, when you were young, did you have a sense of what kind of woman you would be at the age you are now? And do you think that you're the way you would have imagined yourself to be? I don't think kids are capable of doing that. You just don't look that far ahead. First of all, it's too awful, right? (laughs) My idea of the future was the following Wednesday. Uh, And that was more particular to me, too. I remember people would say, do you think you're going to be famous? Do you think you're going to this and that? I had no, you know, I didn't project when I was 16 or 17 years old. It was the following Wednesday that I was, you know, projecting it (laughs) to. And, you know, Karen and I talk about it all the time. I have to laugh. This is not easy. This getting old business. Some people are really patronizing and they don't realize it. I remember my mother in her 90s and somebody was helping her to get into the car. Very nice guy. And he got her in the front seat and he said, there you go. She said, don't patronize me. And I've had a couple of those, but I just want to haul off and whack somebody. But that's their reaction to my age. I just wanted to ask um, one more question about you. We were talking about younger activists and all the issues in the world today. And I noticed you painted a beautiful picture of X Gonzalez, who's one of the activists from Parkland. How do you feel when you see these younger activists and the sort of very, very complex kind of existential issues that they're facing? I think that it's hard for a kid who blasts into this to realize that it's going to take your whole life. You can't, you know, go to school and do your studies and graduate and all that and do this on the side. Mm. It's full on. So you sort of want to shake them and say, listen, you know, it's going to be a choice for you. And we're lucky to have you. And you're not going to be able to do all of this at once. It's risky. You know, how are you going to keep it going? Are you going to keep your heart going and your meditation going and your caring going? Um, It it ain't easy. Mm -hmm. That's also where the music seems so important because that fuels people on a level that without that, it seems really like burnout is inevitable. I think so. And it's interesting to watch the big rallies because mostly people are using recycled illness. <laughs> it's true. You know? Yeah. This generation maybe still has its voice to find in that way. And it's impossible to write a blowing in the wind. The most difficult thing in the world, I think, to write in our genre is an anthem and that's needs an anthem meaning that everybody recognizes it and has their part to sing in it and that's doesn't really exist at the moment i don't think if i had wings like nora's dove i'd fly up the river
being a music star in Jim Bias's time, you might also engage in other activities like film and fashion, which she did to a small degree. But for her, her main other activities were politics, right? With social activism. And that certainly still exists today as well. But now music stars also are emperors <laughs> of business <laughs> empires, right? Evelyn McDonald is a journalist who's covered the music industry for decades. They have fashion lines and they have labels and they have perfumes and they have artists that they maybe help manage or produce. So it's more of a business and a franchise. We called Evelyn to talk about how the music industry has changed for women artists over the years and what audiences have come to expect from pop icons when it comes to political activism. We started by talking about Beyonce and Taylor Swift. Both of them came up in very conventional ways, being in a girl band, trying to get into Nashville in Taylor's case. They wanted stardom pretty explicitly and they pursued it through the conventional industry ways. Not to say that Joan Baez didn't want stardom, but she didn't pursue it. It, it sort of it happened to her in a less purposeful way, let's say. One thing she talked to us about was just the difficulty of writing an anthem like Blowing in the Wind was one she went to specifically. So I feel like there's kind of this paradox there where it seems like songs with political subjects seem rarer, but direct political statements from artists seem maybe more common than in the past. Do you think there's a a tension there? Interesting. I mean, for Joan, it seemed that music was hand in glove with Mm. culture and politics. And I think that Taylor and Beyonce probably came to their politics in part through their experience of the music industry and their experience of the world. I don't think that's explicitly was on their agendas to begin with. I mean, I think they wanted to be self-actualized artists, but they didn't maybe realize crap they were going to encounter along the way from the music industry, right? And that politicized them. And that made Beyonce perform in front of a sign saying feminist and Taylor take control of her own career. It's like her career is her masterpiece. Yeah. So, I mean, can we say how the nature of political activism by musical artists has evolved over this 50, 60 year stretch? Right. I mean, obviously the 60s was a very political time and Leftist politics were very mainstream and guided the counterculture. For Beyonce and Taylor, they kind of grew up in the age of Obama. And so the mainstream politics seemed okay, right? They weren't writing protest music. Joan Baez was writing and singing protest music. But when Destiny's Child sings a song like Independent Women, or even to a degree like Bills, 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 like there's some sort of social consciousness going on there. I think they realized that that was part of the appeal. Women wanted them to express those concerns, but also that they were experiencing those concerns. And you so clearly see that in the like kind of emancipation of Beyonce over the years and of Taylor Swift also, absolutely. At the same time that they've taken control of their careers, they've also become more political. Do you think those two things are related? I mean, you said earlier how you think some of their political engagement maybe stemmed from their early experiences in the music industry? Probably, yes. And I've been in the music industry for a long time as a journalist and seen the way that women get treated. And of course, we've seen that come to the surface so prevalently in the last five years with the Me Too movement and how Taylor had to regain control of her music. Ironically, Beyonce had to regain control of her career somewhat from her own father, right? Her own literal patriarch. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So they're not the artists that are going to say smash the patriarchy, but in some ways they did. And they also enabled an artist like Olivia Rodrigo, who probably will cut a track called smash the patriarchy in the next year. (laughs) I mean, I, I remember that like the formation video really felt like an inflection point to me for Beyonce, where she's facing off against cops and riot gear and stuff. I was like, oh, wow, you know, she's um, like, this isn't subtext anymore when I saw that video. Yeah. The impetus for that album is really her marriage to Jay-Z and the problems of that marriage, right? So it's very 
personal. It's actually interesting to sort of like compare Jambayas and Bob Dylan and Beyonce and Jay-Z. Right. Right? The power couples of their times in the music industry. But interestingly, like, whereas Dylan dumps Joan and is kind of harsh and and then becomes much more famous, Jay-Z and Beyonce have stayed together. And, you know, Beyonce, I think, has eclipsed him. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, of course, their relationship has played out like very publicly, right? In a way that there was no ecosystem for that in Joan Baez's time, right? And I, I wonder how yeah. much of, uh, of just, just being scrutinized around the clock, around the globe, you know, changes your politics, changes your relationship with your audience. You see that in the Joan Baez documentary, though. I think that for the time, she and Bob were pretty much in the public eye. I think they were actually at the kind of epicenter of this pop and political moment and being at the March on Washington and Beatlemania was happening as rock and roll was happening. It just was a much shorter amount of time (laughs) that that they were together in the public eye. I think the interesting thing about Beyonce and, and, and all pop stars today and we think that we know everything about them, but they're they're really controlling what we see and we don't see. That Beyonce recorded Lemonade, like she wanted to let us know that, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, things were not great. She did stand by her man, but she wasn't uh, just doing it quietly. Eras and and Renaissance are carefully <laughs> curated. Uh, they're not displays of interiority. They are very much displays. Yeah. Of, exteriority. I'm thinking here that part of the reason that Beyonce and Taylor Swift, uh, other artists on that scale are more powerful than they've been in the past is they have more economic power, more independence. And, and some of that is because they do endorsements, right? And I, I, I don't want to lump Beyonce and Taylor Swift necessarily together because, you know, Beyonce is kind of her own mogul and sells her own products and, and Taylor Swift does too, but she also does those credit card commercials and, and things. And that's something that artists of Baez's generation would probably not approve of. Do you think that's fair to say? Yeah, I, that is definitely a major cultural shift that's happened over the decades. I do wonder, I mean, I have a kid who's 20, I teach college students. I feel like they are becoming more politicized. The events of the last six years have had profound impacts on them. And I wonder if there is going to be a backlash. Yeah. The dilution of the musical product by seeing it also as a product for shampoo and whatever. Well, I do think my students also know the difference between like what an indie artist is or what a non-commercial artist is. A lot of them, at least in college, go through a phase of preferring an indie artist or one that doesn't seem to belong to the world and to be on their TV all the time. And um, and therefore not to belong to them in the same way. The Taylor Swift phenomenon particularly, is it's just so huge. It's interesting to see what kind of political stands she takes in the next years and what effect that has on her. Do you feel like we now sort of expect that artists who command this kind of audience will weigh in on political or social matters? No. We're so politicized as a country right now. We're to the point where we even expect our pop stars to weigh in. But I don't think that was at all a given. And I think that a lot of people would prefer to just like have their music and not have to have their politics as well. Even if that's sometimes that's veiled, like country music. And also the internet kind of feeds that right the the internet is like a a bloodbath right it's like it's a shark frenzy and it feeds on controversy which in a way means you know that taylor swift and beyonce have to be even more careful and strategic Mm. let's think about like what happened to the dixie chicks when you know they spoke about about politics Yeah. yeah yeah Um, so there's a price that women pay for mouthing off and i guess uh if you've got as much money and Taylor Swift and Beyonce have, you can pay the price. Yeah. (laughs) So so bring it on. (laughs) Um, Well, this has been really fun. Thank you, Evelyn. Thanks, Chris. We 
We've used excerpts from the documentary Joan Baez, I Am a Noise, with permission from Magnolia Pictures and Mead Street Films. I Am a Noise is available on all the major platforms. If you'd like to check it out, you can find a link to the film's website in our show notes. We've learned a lot about influential musicians in this episode, but did you know that sometimes recording artists help solve major crimes? You'll find out more about that in this week's Dinner Party Fact. Hello, this is Ted Scheinman. I'm a senior editor at Smithsonian Magazine, and I had a fascinating time editing this great feature about the most lucrative art fraud in history, still ongoing, whereby a bunch of Canadian fraudsters created perhaps around $100 million worth of fake canvases by the indigenous artist uh, Norval Morisot, one of Canada's absolutely most esteemed artists. One of the reasons this case actually picked up steam in Canada is because of the deep commitment to indigenous art of a man named Kevin Hearn, who's a keyboardist and multi-instrumentalist in the band Bare Naked Ladies, the Canadian band that had a hit with that song One Week in the 1990s. And it's very funny to me because, and also a little bit troubling, because a lot of people ignored these art frauds for a really long time until Canada's equivalent of like Jimmy Page or Madonna stepped in and said, hey, I'm going to basically train myself to be a private investigator and learn to distinguish a true Morisot from a fake canvas. And I love that. I don't know what the equivalent would be in the U.S., but I just think if, like, Mumford and Sons came out and said, like, hey, we need to take another look at some of these lithographs, (laughs) I'm not sure it would have the same weight. There's more to that as a production of Smithsonian Magazine and PRX Productions. From the magazine, our team is me, Deborah Rosenberg, and Brian Wally. From PRX, our team is Jessica Miller, Genevieve Sponsler, Adriana Rosas Rivera, Rai Dorsey, and Edwin Ochoa. The executive producer of PRX Productions is Jocelyn Gonzalez. Our episode artwork is by Emily Lankwitz. Fact checking by Stephanie Abramson. Our music is from APM Music. I'm Chris Klemek. Thank you for listening.